Is your clan Tartan part of a con job? Meet the infamous Sobieski Stewarts. In the 1820s, two English brothers, John Carter Allen and Charles Manning Allen, came up with a scheme to cash in on the craze for tartans and Scottish culture, which was sweeping the United Kingdom at that point. Born in England, the brothers moved to Scotland and converted to Catholicism. In the late 1820s, they appeared with a new exotic persona of John Sobieski Stewart and Charles Edward Stewart. The story they spun was that their father, Thomas Allen had been born in Italy and was the only legitimate child of Bonnie Prince Charlie and his wife, Princess Louise of Stolberg Gettern. The brothers claimed that to escape kidnapping or assassination, young Thomas had been brought secretly to England on a ship captained by Admiral John Carter Allen, who later adopted Thomas. Thus, their father Thomas was, according to the brothers, the rightful heir to the House of Stuart and the British Crown. There was only one small problem. This was a complete fabrication. No documents detail the birth of Thomas Allen, though it seems he might have been the illegitimate son of Admiral John Carter Allen himself. Thomas married Catherine Matilda Manning, and through their union, they had a daughter, Matilda, and two sons, the brothers, John and Charles. Now, their childhood wasn't all that great. Aside from his three children with Catherine, Thomas also fathered five illegitimate children, went to debtor's prison, and later disappeared in an attempt to evade creditors, as you do. Their father's murky past and later disappearance made it easy for them to spin their romantic myth of Stuart lineage. Of course, not everyone believed their claims, but the brothers were intriguing to the populace all the same. Beginning in 1829, the brothers began circulating manuscripts of tartan patterns supposedly compiled 100 years earlier in the 1720s. According to them, these were the long hidden and forgotten official clan tartans going back to the Middle Ages. It's important to note here that the revelation of these undiscovered manuscripts came at the perfect time in history, maybe a little too perfect. A few years earlier, in 1815, the Highland Society of London wrote to the clan chiefs asking for samples of their clan tartans. This was a problem because many of the clans had not decided on an official clan tartan. And this problem only got worse in 1822 when King George IV visited Edinburgh and Sir Walter Scott set up a special gathering for all the clans. The required dress was Highland wear, specifically clan tartans. Now, this was kind of like the Wild West for tartan designs. Some of the clan lairds rushed to just slap their names on tartans from the Wilsons of Bannockburn key pattern book. Others deferred to knowledge of older clansmen to find out what they wore back in the old days, preferably during the 1745 uprising. The Sobieski Stewarts arrived on the scene a few years later, initially peddling their fake ancestry to con a living out of the Scottish notables. In Scotland, the brothers conducted themselves as members of a reigning dynasty who wished to stay incognito. False modesty, of course, because they never stopped writing and publishing books about Scottish history and folklore that supported their false claims. The brothers and their claims elicited strong reactions, both positive and negative, even in their own lifetime. Not everybody was buying what they were selling. Sir Walter Scott decried the works of the Sobieski Stuarts from the start. The great English Catholic prelate Herbert Vaughan called their story an impudent fabrication and an unblushing fraud. But the strongest attack on their works and claims came later in an article in 1847 titled The Heirs of the Stuarts by Glasgow University law professor George Skeen. Quote, this pretend manuscript of 16th century is an absolute fabrication and of no authority whatsoever. And he called the Stuarts' claims to royal blood the silliest of dreams. And yet the brothers had several prominent supporters and patrons, including Scottish elites, like the 10th Earl of Moray, the Marquis of Butte, the 12th Lord Lovett, and the famous scientist Robert Chambers. For a time, the brothers lived quite well, despite their claims coming under attack. The Earl of Moray put them up in his estate for nine years, from 1829 to 1838. Lord Lovett built them an antique shooting lodge in Inverness, and there they actually held court from 1838 to 1845, always wearing the Stuart Tartan. Now, imagine for a minute, traveling on a horse or in a carriage to the shooting lodge to meet the descendants of Bonnie Prince Charlie. Those who romanticized Jacobites in Victorian times wanted so badly for it to be true that Bonnie Prince Charlie had heirs and that they were in their presence that they willingly overlooked the cloudy story surrounding the Sobieski Stewart's claims. 
As one writer put it, the Sobieski succeeded in fabricating around them an aura of bogus royalty which attracted an allegiance of romantic Jacobites in Victorian times. Did they put on a good show? Well, in her 1911 Memoirs of a Highland Lady, Elizabeth Grant wrote, They were handsome men, particularly John Sobieski, who, however, had not a trace of the Stuart in his far finer face. They always wore the Highland dress, kilt and belted plaid, and looked melancholy and spoke at times mysteriously. The effect they produced was astonishing. They were fetid to their heart's content. For several years, they actually reigned in the North Country. Eventually, the charade did peter out and the brothers would leave Scotland. Though they never stopped grifting and they never admitted any wrongdoing. So what about the Tartans? The public's appetite for tartans had only gained traction since George IV's visit to Edinburgh in 1822. In the late 1830s, the newly crowned Queen Victoria was extremely outspoken for her appreciation of all things Scottish, including tartans and Highland dress. The public's appetite for clan tartans was primed and ready, and in 1842, that's when the Sobieski Stuarts released their most audacious work to date, the Vestiarium Scoticum. This was purported to be a reproduction of a 16th century manuscript. Of course, no one other than the brothers was allowed to lay eyes on the original. Possession of the secret knowledge of the supposed manuscript was one of the brothers' main levers for winning over their victims. In 1842, the brothers were ready to share their research with the world. Now, despite the cloud of suspicion around them, the book was a success. All the tartan illustrations were done by Charles. And even as dubious as everyone knew the Stuarts' designs were, they were still more or less accepted for decades. The Tartans presented in Vestiarium Scoticum were divided into Highland clans, Lowland clans, and Border clans. There was something for everybody. Even families that would have never worn Tartans historically because it just wasn't a thing in their region. That said, many of the designs were accepted by Scottish families and became official clan Tartans. It may all seem ridiculous in hindsight, but at the time, the public was really hungry for more tartan, especially named clan patterns, and they were eager to pay. Sir Walter Scott, among others, even speculated that the brothers were in cahoots with the tartan mills in a plot to reinvigorate and exploit the tartan craze that was sweeping the nation at the time. Now, no conclusive evidence supports this other than the mill's readiness to accept all the new tartans at face value and take all the orders, of course. The first in-depth analysis of the Tartans didn't actually come until 1980. This book being Scotland's Forged Tartans by D.C. Stewart and J.C. Thompson. This very thorough work finally put to rest whether the brothers had ever had any real historical precedent for any of their designs. Spoiler alert, they didn't. Are you wondering if you've ever seen a tartan designed by the Sobieskis? You probably have. Some of the more famous ones include Bruce, Cameron, Lindsay, McLean Hunting, McLeod of Lewis, Scott. In all, the Sobieskis designed over 60 tartans and included them in Vestiarium Scoticum, passing them off as historical patterns. If you're thinking this whole thing sounds kind of crazy, you're not wrong. But here's the takeaway. Maybe the fact that the tartans are only 180 years old really isn't that big of a deal. In fact, a lot of what we consider to be traditional Highland dress isn't much older than that to begin with. Now, regardless of how they came about, many of the Sobieski patterns are quite attractive, so perhaps their murky origin story really isn't an issue. And if these designs have been adopted by clan chiefs and accepted by the general public, who are we to judge? When it comes to tartan or any symbol, it's the meaning that we ascribe to it that matters. In the end, it's not about the tartan. It's about the people that wear it and what it means to them. Now, it's hard to paint the Sobieskis with a single broad brush of con men, although they were that. But regardless of what you think of them, they did, for better or worse, have a huge impact on Highland wear. This has led many historians to look on them a bit more kindly or with some forgiveness for their spurious claims. Let's explore that for a minute. The brothers had been churning out materials on a regular basis for over 20 years to support their fabricated family story, which in turn supported their lifestyle. This was their long con of being treated as royalty with all the associated perks. The Vestiarium Scoticum was just one of the things that they put out to support their con, but it was the one that had the biggest reverberating impact. Did they invent 60 or 70 tartans out of thin air? Yes. 
Did they have help from a mill to draw up the designs? Possibly. Now, was this a victimless crime? Outside of the distorting of history, yeah, it kind of was. Has Highland Ware, have the woolen mills, has Scotland benefited from their works? Absolutely. So while they were shady characters who tried to pull a fast one on everybody, we have to tip our hats at least a little bit for what they did for Scotland's national dress. Thanks for watching, guys. What do you think? Were the Sobieski Stewarts just straight up con men, or are they the unsung heroes of Highland Ware having invented so many tartans and giving it a jump start? Let us know in the comments. If you want to see other videos on tartan, check out this playlist over here. If you want to see more Scottish history videos, check out that playlist down there.